CataractCoach.com. We've got our Cataract Coach curriculum. Today, lesson three, you're ready to operate. CataractCoach.com. Do you get nervous or anxious in the operating room? You must control your state of mind. Sometimes a resident will say, when you sit next to me in the operating room, I really appreciate that you're there, you can teach me, and you have a lot of wisdom, and you can rescue the case, but you also make me nervous. I was like, I can understand that, but you gotta be able to control that, it's in the mind. You control that, you control your heart rate. This morning, my first two patients were the mother and father of a fellow ophthalmologist here in Los Angeles. This is a person I've known, I've known him for many years, 10 years or more. And he brought both his parents to me to do their cataract surgeries. And as I did their surgeries, I sat over there in the microscope and did them. And he sat right here and watched on the monitor. So he watched me do his mom's surgery and his dad's surgery. And how nervous was I? I was not. I was calm and collected. Here's the proof. So there's my resting, 53. The current heart rate is gonna show me, 79. And if I scroll up, boom. Look at the range there. My heart rate never even got to 100. Got max was 91. You can see the timing there. I slept really well. Woke up, started operating here around six in the morning. And all these cases we've cranked out, my heart rate's never gotten above 91. So what does that tell you? It's in your mind, you can control it. And I operated on a mom and a dad of a fellow ophthalmologist. So here's the dad's video. This is the father of an ophthalmologist who's sitting and watching you operate live. There's the incision that looks really good. And this is no joke of a cataract in this elderly patient. And here comes a capsularexis. Now this is the part of surgery that makes a lot of people nervous. But instead we stay calm. Equanimity under duress. Or in this case, maybe just equanimity under stress. And so I just focused on the task at hand and I know in my mind, I can control my own emotions, my own heart rate even, my own response to this little bit of stress. And it doesn't bother me, and I can still do a beautiful job. There's the capsorexis, and now let's fast forward to the end of the case, and there's the eye well in the bag, and you can see it's a really nice overlap. It looks pretty darn good, just like I wanted it to. And again, not nervous at all, and you saw from my watch, the pulsometer showed that my pulse didn't get above 91 beats per minute. Now let's go to the mom, similar for the mom. So again, throughout this whole procedure, the son, who's an ophthalmologist, is watching me perform this. And it's no problem, it's no pressure to me. I stay calm and collected, and I just do as beautiful as a job as I can. So again, measuring out that capsorex is taking our time here. Now in the inset, in that picture, that's live surgery at the academy meeting, at the AAO, American Academy of Ophthalmology. I've done live surgery at the ASCRS. I've done live surgery at many meetings in a dozen different countries. Imagine doing a live surgical event where you're operating and a thousand or two thousand of your fellow ophthalmologists are watching you operate live. And yes, they're supporting you, but just think about it. When you go watch a car race, you want to see the winners, but you wouldn't mind seeing a crash or two as long as no one gets seriously hurt. And so in these big meetings, when you're doing live surgery, how do you keep calm? If you want to watch that video of live surgery, that one's actually on YouTube. Just search for it. Put my name in and type in live surgery. You'll find it. And you can do live surgery in front of a 1,000 or 2,000 fellow ophthalmologists and stay calm and collected, and it's not an issue. And I want you to be able to have that same control. And the way you get this is it's mind over body. Your mind is your most powerful weapon. Here at the end of the case, you can see beautiful incision, beautiful rexus, lens is beautifully centered. The prochingium is right in the center of that optic. This is just a really nice result, sweeping the angle, making sure there's no retained viscoelastic, a little adjustment of the lens position. That's fantastic and a beautiful result. And the patient was very happy and the son who's the ophthalmologist is also happy. So look at this heart rate. What's this heart rate going up and down, up and down? Is that you during a surgery? You're sitting there for this long surgery and the heart keeps going up and down and up. No, that actually is me lifting weights. That's my working out. 
the heart monitor. We stay calm and collected in the OR because look at the picture on the right. We have mind over body control. Meditate if you need to. Find your special place. Do what it takes. But you have the ability to not be nervous in the operating room. And I have faith in you that you can do it. CataractCoach.com The secret to a great red reflex during surgery. Look at the left side of the screen. The two green arrows are the coaxial lights. Each is lined up with the oculars. And the yellow shows the paraxial light, which is just off by a few degrees. And they together give good lighting. So if I look at an eye here, you see the three lights reflected off the cornea. Now we'll switch it to just the one. That is the paraxial light. And I can go back and bring in the coaxials. So it's the coaxial light that gives that red reflex. So looking under the scope, there's the paraxial. There in the center, that is now the coaxial. If I focus on that, you see it's one is coming with each ocular. And I can dim it down, which makes that a little bit uh, less bright. So again, on this surgical eye here, with just the paraxial light, it's good lighting, but insufficient red reflex. If I turn on the coaxial lights, now I get a great red reflex. And we can dial in more or less out of these two. So it's the balance between the paraxial light and the coaxial light that helps give us good illumination. The paraxial light is the overall general illumination of the eye. And the two coaxial lights, they're coaxial with each of your oculars. These coaxial lights give you the great red reflex. And you can set the balance between the two to emphasize it so it's easier for you to see. So the current settings right now are what I'd use typically for surgery. And you can see it's a pretty even balance between the paraxial and the coaxial. But now I can crank it up even brighter. This is more of the coaxial, so stronger red reflex. And I tend to shoot the videos with a stronger coaxial lighting because it allows you to see the details of things like the capsorexis a lot better. So I'll do the capsorex in this case, and you can see as soon as we poke in, even though this capsule, of course, is very thin, it's so easy to see where's the edge. And that's because of the red reflex. So here, we, again, emphasizing the coaxial lighting. Coaxial meaning each of these lights, these two twin lights, are in line with my two oculars. Some machines call it stereo coaxial illumination, but either way, it's coaxial with your oculars. And it'll change from machine to machine, but all of the more modern microscopes will have this ability. And again, you see we can alternate more now to the even stronger coaxial red reflex, which will be helpful. Let's fast forward to the end of the case here. And there we go. We see the light reflex, the two Purkinje images reflected back to you. And again, the two larger lights are the coaxial and the smaller is the paraxial. There's paraxial alone, and now we switch back to having both. So give it a try. Thanks for watching. CataractCoach.com, how to set up your FACO machine. All surgeons must know this. You gotta be able to do this solo. It's important. So I know you're the big surgeon, but you also have to know how to set up the machine. What if you have a tech who's not capable of doing it, a different tech? What if you're here in an evening for a ruptured globe case? You wanna take the lens out? You wanna evacuate a big hyphema? You have to know how to set up that machine. So let's show you a video of how to do so. All right, let's take a look here. So we've placed in the bag of balance salt solution, and this is gonna be specific to our machine here, but you should know how your machine works. You close that, and there's some pressure plates in there that'll squeeze the bag. Now here on the side, there's a little special pocket here. We save a little packet of anterior vitrectomy just in case we need it. It's right there, ready to go. You don't have to hunt for it. It's always gonna be there in the machine. So keep those in there just in case. Now I look to the front here. Here's the remote control. We see we wrote, do not throw away on it. And that's so the technician can control this without even touching the screen. So you can do it from that remote control. You could also place a plastic over the screen if you wanted to and use that as a sterile barrier. So it's important to get things set up here. Here's the Mayo stand cover going over. Mayo stand cover going on top of the arm there on the FACO probe. And then you notice the pockets being made there in that wire rim. In that pocket, we're gonna be able to place the FACO probe, et cetera. Now, we gotta get the, the cartridge. We gotta install that. We've gotta uh, plug in through the infusion line. 
And so the machine is very simple. It gives you direct instructions on the screen. If you look at the screen here, on the machine, it tells you how to do it. So you place that cartridge in there sterilely, don't contaminate your hands. And then we can place that in. That's to have the connection to the inflow fluid. Now these two here are connected together. And again, there are instructions right on the machine. And then now using the remote control, you can advance to the next step here. So it says here, it's drawing in fluid. So it'll draw fluid, get fluid through the line, make sure there's no air on the lines, and it'll do this and it'll tell you when it's ready. And when it's ready, we can advance the machine over to the vacuum check. So you can see a little bit of fluid going there in that, in that bag. So it, now we prime the machine, it draws in the fluid, again, drawing the fluid in. And so this is proprietary to this Centurion machine, but again, all machines run similarly. Now you see that bag in the front, now you know it's a peristaltic machine, right? We've talked about the difference between Venturi pumps and peristaltic pumps, and you should be able to understand and use either one. It's really not that big of a deal. So we advance to the vacuum check here, and it starts to check the vacuum. And once it does checks the vacuum, and we know it's working well, and the pump has been primed, now we can place the FACO probe on it. So watch carefully. So now that's done, and it'll tell you when it's ready. It'll give you a notice here that says, okay, we're ready to go advance to the next step. And so here's plugging in the FACO probe, again, done sterilely. You, if you freshly cook these, you want to make sure they're not too hot. Now we can connect the lines, the infusion line and the aspiration line to the FACO probe. And of course, you should know which one is which. The one that's thinner bore is going to be the aspiration line. The one that's a wider bore is going to be the infusion. Now we'll put the FACO tip on there. You see that should be tightened up about 10 pound feet of torque or about as tight as you turn a bottle of um, soda so you wouldn't lose any okay. Just carbonation from it. Okay. So when that needle goes on there, now the sleeve goes on top and the sleeve depends on the incision size you're using. This is for a 2.75 millimeter incision. And once that's placed in the correct orientation and lined up, then we'll get the test chamber. Okay. The test chamber is that little bubble thing down there. And so we'll get that test chamber and get it filled up, and then we'll put that on yeah, top the of the, test, the, test chamber, the, the FACO tip and have it primed. Oh, so yeah. the, our technician here yeah. still wants to get some uh, BSS first, so we're going to go there, and we're going to fill. And so this BSS fluid obviously can be used later on in the case. And so filling up a little cup with that, that's just BSS right from the cap, that uh, the bag of fluid of BSS. And then we can advance to the test of the handpiece. And you can see she's already filled the test chamber and placed that on top of the machine, the FACO tip. And then as it goes to the next setting, it now checks the flow, the vacuum, and it also tunes the FACO handpiece. And once that's tuned up and ready to go, it'll give you a check mark and say, hey, we're ready. Now hit chop mode and we are ready for surgery. So please watch this carefully. Make sure you know how to do this. CataractCoach.com four times when you should not operate these are some really important lessons there are four times when you should not operate remember any surgeon can operate but it takes a surgeon with judgment good judgment to know when not to operate and that's such an important lesson to learn in your training because as a young resident in training this pearl goes against your flawed thinking because the thinking as a resident is, I want to maximize the number of surgeries that I perform because I want to increase my experience in the operating room. But remember, the mark of a great surgeon is sound intraoperative surgical judgment as well as the ability to decide when not to operate. So the first case situation I want to tell you about is when patients have unrealistic expectations. Patients must have realistic expectations regarding the potential results of surgery. Let's be frank here. There's no surgery that turns back the clock. I can't take a 72-year-old and give them the vision they had when they were 22 years old. Not going to happen. So patients have to understand that an all surgery, no matter how safe or seemingly simple, carries some degree of risk. There's no surgery that has 0% risk. And though it sounds obvious, we have to remember that we're operating on our patient's eyes, right? Their most precious sense. Patients are going to see the world every waking moment for the rest of their lives through your surgery. So surgical procedures that I routinely perform, like cataract and refractive, they have limitations. We have advanced technology IOLs, but none of them perform as well as the natural human lens in a young person. 
There are no man-made body parts, whether it's a lens implant, a heart valve, an artificial hip, that are as good as being 22 years old and young and healthy again. Does not exist. Same way, there's no plastic surgery that's going to make a 70-year-old look like a 20-year-old. None. So when patients expect surgical results that are beyond what we can deliver, it's best to avoid performing surgery. Now, the second situation is when the risks of the surgery outweigh the benefits, especially in a reoperation. Ocular tissue is delicate, and for reoperations, every subsequent surgery is more difficult than the previous, and the tissue is less able to handle the procedure. A good example of this is the corneal endothelium, which tends to lose cell with every intraocular surgery. For a patient with a borderline endothelial cell count and increased corneal pachymetry, you better be very cautious about performing another surgical procedure. You gotta balance the potential benefit of your proposed surgery with the potential risks, which are now higher because of the condition of the cornea. So you have risks that are a little bit higher and benefits that are a little bit lower. The same can be applied to retina surgery, glaucoma surgery, even strabismus surgery, where the tissues can only take so much surgical intervention before deteriorating. Be cautious. Number three, when patients have unstable or serious systemic medical issues. We have to remember to look at the whole patient, not just the eyes. Even though our intentions may be good, sometimes performing ocular surgery in patients with grave medical issues may not be in their best interest. Recently, I saw a patient in consultation with advanced cataracts that gave him 20 out of 100 vision in both eyes. He wanted surgery badly, but he was having issues with a number of serious systemic medical problems. So he made a decision to defer his ocular procedure until after he was declared stable by his primary care doctor and his cardiologist. Now, remember, the eyes are certainly important for daily functioning, but a perfect result from ocular surgery is not possible or even useful if the patient expires from the severe systemic medical conditions. So treat the patient first then the eyes. And if you have a condition like a cataract, it's been there for years, and delaying it another month or two while your systemic health is optimized is not a big deal. While cataract surgery can reasonably be expected to last the duration of the patient's life, the same may not be true for other ocular procedures like glaucoma surgery or complex such as sewn-in IOLs. The longevity of a surgical result is an important consideration, especially for younger patients. Using a technique such as intrascleral haptic pocket, the Agarwal glued IOL technique, or the four-point fixation with the Gore-Tex, with the, the IOL through the sclera, that may be a better choice for long-term IOL fixation when compared to a sonar technique using a delicate tenno polypropylene suture. So a procedure that's expected to have a limited functional year time frame it can still be appropriate as long as the patient understands the likely need for a reoperation in the future. And our fourth and final one is, don't operate when the patients would fare better by seeing a different surgeon, another subspecialist. So surgeons tend to gravitate towards fields that interest them, and with time this becomes a narrower and narrower focus. So every year I learn more and more deeper knowledge about less and less. And so now anything cataract, I breathe it, eat it, sleep it, drink it, I love cataract coach, right? So when we're in our training as a resident, we know a little bit about many specialties. But as we mature surgeons, we tend to super specialize, so we know a tremendous amount about a narrow range of procedures. There are times where patients present with an ocular condition that's outside my area of expertise and comfort level. It is far better ref to refer the patient than attempt to do a procedure that's beyond my level of surgical experience or skill. A good example of this is, you see a patient who needs four-point sclerofixation using Gore-Tex of an IOL. Okay, I can do that. I have many videos of that. This patient has extensive retinal pathology, vitreous prolapse every, everywhere. The existing IOL is halfway in the vitreous body. Stop. This is not a case for me to do. A retina specialist should do a full parse plane of a 
take out all the vitreous, check all the retina, the peripheral retina, make sure it's all normal, laser any weakness, and then let the retina specialist suture in this four-point fixation IOL. You're better off that way. So patients must be involved in the decision to operate, and they must actually want to have the surgery. The patient want, must ha want the surgery more than you want to give it. If you asked a, a person out for dinner, and the person said, okay, fine, I'll have dinner with you, do you still want to go? No. But if the patient says, oh, I would love to have dinner with you, now you're excited, now you want to do it. So the patient has to want surgery at least as much or even more than you want to give it. So patients who reluctantly agree to surgery are the ones who tend to be the most difficult to please after the surgery. And remember, once you do surgery on a patient, in a sense, you own that patient for life. And the converse holds true. The patient owns you for life. Any future ocular issues may be perceived as occurring due to the effect of your surgery. And that may not even be the case. So remember, depending on the situation, sometimes the best surgery may be no surgery at all. Something to think about. Thanks for watching. Thanks for watching these videos. And remember to go to cataractcoach.com and sign up for a free daily email. We'll send you an email every day with a great video like this and other surgical pearls that'll make you a better surgeon.